Hello, this is Bill Worrell with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Welcome to today's edition of 15 Minutes in the Forest. All right, well, hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well. My name is Wally Smith. And I'm an associate professor of biology at the University of Virginia's College at Wise. And we are here at a big system of cliffs and rock outcrops up on High Nob above the city of Norton to talk about a really interesting animal, one of our most unique amphibians that we have here in southwest Virginia called the green salamander. And if you're familiar with amphibians, you may know that we are in an amphibian hotspot here in southern Appalachia. We actually have uh, some of the highest amphibian diversity in the temperate world right here in our mountains. And the green salamander is a great example of that. It's one of about 20 to 25 different species that you can find in different parts of our area. Depending on where you live in the region, you may have that many salamanders in and around where you live. And one of the reasons why we have so much diversity here in our mountains is because of places like where I am today. Uh, we have a very temperate climate and we have a lot of moisture. You can see that these rocks here have a lot of mosses, a lot of lichens that illustrate just how much moisture this area gets. And that temperate climate, that high amount of moisture is really great for salamanders because being amphibians, they have no way to regulate their internal body temperature, so they need a nice temperate climate to survive. So that helps us have a lot of different species that occur here. In addition to the variety of habitats that we have across our mountains, from cliffs like this, uh, down to our bigger rivers and streams, to our headwater streams and our temperate hardwood forest, those all as well provide a lot of eco ecological space where we can pack a lot of different amphibian species together. So the green salamander that we're here to talk about today is really unique because typically when you think about salamanders in our neck of the woods, uh, if you or your kids possibly have gone looking for salamanders before, where you typically look are under logs or rocks, either on the forest floor or in a headwater stream. You lift up those rocks or logs and the salamander kind of scurries out. This salamander is very different and instead green salamanders are a rock outcrop specialist. The only place in the world where they live is where you've got good vertical cliff and bluff covers and smaller rock outcrops, kind of like the ones that you see here. And they need those habitats because where they live is back in the cracks and crevices around these rocks. So where you've got really good fissures in the rock like you see around me here, the salamanders fit back into there. Uh, they spend the winter there, they spend part of the year there foraging. They actually reproduce in those crevices as well. And then also you can see some trees and some vegetation around me. In the summer, these salamanders are really interesting as well because they come out of the rocks and in warmer weather, they actually go up into the forest canopy and they become arboreal, which means that they're gonna be tree dwelling species. And they do that temporarily. You can find them on occasion like 30, 40, 50 feet up uh, in some of those trees up in the forest canopy. We're still trying to understand exactly what they're doing when they go up in those habitats, but we know uh, that good kind of cliffy, bluffy places like this one with a lot of vegetation around it tend to be good for that species. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to walk around and see if we can find some of these animals, see if we can get some footage, uh, talk a little bit about their biology, about what makes them unique, and then we'll also talk about some ways that private landowners, folks who are out hiking, maybe rock climbing in the region, ways that they can help us manage those species, conserve those species, and then also help us learn more about them. So here we have an individual green salamander that we have found crawling around here on the rock outcrops actually near uh, the mouth of one of the crevices here at this particular rock face. And it's a really good example of what your stereotypical green salamander looks like. And the first thing that really jumps out obviously whenever you see one of these species is the bright green coloration that gives its name as well as some of that splotchy patterning that you see across the back. This species is really the only truly green terrestrial salamander that we have here in the Appalachian region and in Virginia. There is a much more widespread species called the Eastern Newt that is aquatic and lives in a lot of ponds and wetlands across the state that has more of kind of like an olive green coloration across the back as an adult. It is completely widespread across Virginia. The green salamander here, uh, again, is fully terrestrial. It's never found in water and has a much more bright green coloration and also is much more range restricted in the state. It actually only lives in some of the southwesternmost counties uh, in Virginia across the Appalachian Plateau and the Valley and Ridge. But that green coloration is actually very important for the species. It actually serves as a double duty type of camouflage for these animals. And as you can see here, this animal against the rocks shows that very well. That green coloration helps to camouflage the organism against the mosses and the lichens that occur on those rocks. And then in addition, since these animals move up into the forest canopy uh, later in the summer, that green coloration also helps to camouflage it against some of the leaves in the forest canopy and then also some of the mosses and lichens that you see on tree surfaces as well. And beyond that coloration, there are a number of other adaptations that really highlight this species' proclivity for rock outcrops. And one of those that you can see whenever you see one of these animals very close uh, is the suction cup-like toe tips that they have on their feet. 
If you have seen uh, tree frogs suction cup like toes in either, either uh, nature document documentaries with tropical tree frogs or the gray tree frog, our most common uh, tree frog here in Virginia that is often found in warmer weather on like people's windows at their homes, those species have very suction cup like toes that allow them to get grip to climb when they're climbing on trees and other surfaces. Green salamanders are very similar. They have those suction cup like toe tips that allow them to get some enhanced grip on rock outcrops and trees, and they actually even have kind of square shaped toe tips that are a little unique with that species. So that helps them become one of nature's rock, uh, rock climbers. And then also they have what is called a dorsoventrally flattened body. That is basically the scientific technical way to say that they're flattened like a pancake. So that means that instead of having a cylindrical body like many other salamanders do, or kind of a blocky shaped body, these animals are very flat and that allows for them to fit back into those thin rock crevices where they spend most of their lives. Uh, females even reproduce there, so they will hang their eggs individually by a single strand of mucus in those rock crevices, so being able to fit into those rock crevices is very important, having that flattened body. And then also when they are living in the forest, occasionally these salamanders as well will fit back into uh, spaces behind loose bark on trees or hollow limbs and stems on trees or other woody vegetation. And again, having that flattened body gives them an added uh, kind of enhanced benefit to fit back into some of those tight spaces. So it's a very unique animal. It also has a, kind of a unique evolutionary context. It is a member of the genus Aeneides, and there are other salamander species in this genus, but they are all found uh, out towards the west coast in places like California and the northwest. There has been a new species recently described in this genus from the east, but it actually was a member of the green salamanders or a collection of populations uh, within the green salamanders that have recently been split off down in a particular area in western North Carolina where there was kind of some hidden genetic diversity uh, that people have recently discovered. So when it comes to you know this group of green salamanders that have this very distinct morphology, these are the only members of this genus that live in the east, which makes them very unique, and then also a relatively rare member of our eastern forest, especially here in the Appalachian Plateau and the Valley and Ridge in southwest Virginia. So here we've got a wonderful example of green salamander habitat. This kind of has the entire recipe that you're looking for if you're a green salamander. Uh, you got the rocks behind us here and you can see that the rocks have a lot of uh, nice crevices and spaces and voids in there where the salamanders can live. And then also around me, we've got a lot of woody vegetation. We've got you know trees up in the canopy. We've got the rhododendron here, uh, some hemlocks kind of down in the understory. And that also is a really important component of green salamander habitat because the animal doesn't just live here in the rocks. In the summer, it also comes out in the surrounding forest to forage. So the closer you've got woody vegetation to the rocks, the better it tends to be for that animal. And that's really important for private landowners. One of the things that we've been stressing to folks that have rock outcrops on their property, even if it's not this big of a cliff like I have here, even if it's a smaller rock outcrop that's just a couple of feet tall, uh, we encourage folks whenever they can to leave as much woody vegetation as they can around the rocks. I always think about it kind of like a blanket of vegetation. The more of a blanket you've got, protecting that rock outcrop, the better it's going to be. So, you know, if you're clearing your land for any reason, if you've got some timbering going on, a really good best management practice to preserve the green salamanders is to leave that blanket, leave a buffer of woody vegetation around the rocks. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service, when they're doing timbering in our part of the state, they'll leave a couple hundred feet typically around the rocks, but anything less than that is good as well. As long as you've got that woody vegetation there, that tends to be good for the species. And we think the reason it's so valuable is kind of for a couple of reasons, and this site here shows it pretty well. You can see how shaded it is around me here, so having that blanket of woody vegetation becomes important because it helps to keep the rocks nice and cool and moist as well for the salamanders. And then also if you think about an animal that's going to be moving out of the rocks to go forage in the forest in the summer, the less energy you can expend to get out into the forest is going to be better. So if you've got more vegetation close to the rocks, even touching the rocks, that gives a greater ease of movement out of the rocks up into the forest. And at this site here, there's a couple of things going on. This is mostly good habitat, but there is a couple of places here where folks have trimmed back some of the rhododendron. So there's some cut rhododendron stumps. There was some mountain laurel here as well that was cut away. And the reason for that here is somebody was developing a climbing route and they wanted to free up access to the rock. And this is a good example of what we kind of encourage folks to avoid if they can, you know, to build 
climbing routes around the vegetation that's there if you can. Uh, again, if you're doing uh, management maintenance work on your property, try to keep that woody vegetation there. And that tends to be the best for these animals that require uh, this habitat and really nowhere else for their home. So here's another good example of one of the management practices that we've been recommending to folks that have rock outcrops on their property, or uh, maybe you're a park manager in the region or something like we are here, or like at a spot where we are here uh, with a lot of rocks around. And obviously you can see the graffiti here on the rocks. You know, I think that as long as we have people around, there's gonna be graffiti and that's something that we're gonna have to grapple with. But one of the things we've noticed here in the region here in Southwest Virginia over the last few years is that as outdoor recreation has become more popular, and as more folks are hiking, as people are getting out rock climbing, enjoying some of the public lands, we've noticed a big uptick in graffiti like this. And for green salamanders, this can kind of be a double-edged sword. So graffiti can be harmful when it's spray painted onto the rocks for the salamanders because the chemicals in the paint can be toxic to the salamanders. But we're also finding too that sometimes even graffiti removal can be harmful for the salamanders as well, which is kind of counterintuitive. But the reason for that is that in order to get uh, paint like this off of a rock, there are graffiti removal chemicals that you can purchase. And a lot of those chemicals, in order to strip that paint, have to be pretty harsh. And so those chemicals like the paint, if they get put onto the rock, can be toxic to the salamanders. A lot of those removal processes as well involve things like pressure washing. So the high pressure water spraying up against the rocks or getting back into those crevices, that can literally you know, cut an adult salamander in half or damage the eggs that might be laid back in those crevices since that's where the salamanders reproduce. So we're encouraging folks, if you do have graffiti problems that you want to remediate, we're seeing a lot of groups in our area uh, want to take care of that to try to find a way that involves the least amount of chemicals as you can. I know that can be tough to do because we're talking about removing paint off of rocks. And then also as well, if you're planning a big graffiti removal operation, if you've got a lot of graffiti that you want to take care of, consider contacting the Department of Wildlife Resources and talking to some of their biologists. They can probably give some tips to how you might be able to minimize some of those impacts to green salamanders at a site. Or even look me up, my contact information is on the college website, on the UVA WISE website. And I'd be happy to come out if you're gonna do a big graffiti removal project and do some surveys to see if the salamanders are there. If they aren't, you're probably okay, but if we've got some around, that might mean that you have to look at some alternative methods. But unfortunately, this is a problem that we're grappling with more and more, and it is one of those things to consider just because this habitat is so specific for this particular species. Another question that we're frequently getting comes from the rock climbing community, since many rock climbers are in and around these rock outcrops where green salamanders live. And the single best rule of thumb when it comes to conserving green salamanders as a rock climber is to simply avoid trimming back things like the rhododendron and mountain laurel, uh, the other woody vegetation that are around that rock face, uh, limiting things like scrubbing off mosses and lichens from the rocks can be beneficial as well, because all of that vegetation is really important to making sure that green salamanders have the appropriate microclimate, the temperature and moisture that they need around those rocks. So really that means when you're developing new climbing routes, so uh, if you're developing a new route at a crag or a new boulder problem, uh, developing those around existing vegetation can be very helpful instead of clearing that vegetation away. And then in addition, just limiting things like chalk use in and around those rock outcrops can be important. Uh, green salamanders are lungless, so they lack lungs and they breathe th entirely through their skin and the lining of their mouth. So making sure that you minimize the use of chalk on those rocks can make sure that those salamanders don't get covered with that chalk, which could interfere uh, with their respiration across their skin. But really it is the protection of habitat in and around those rock outcrops that is so important for the climbing community. And so I'll close my remarks here with a little bit, I guess, of a cry for help uh, about ways that members of the public can help us better understand green salamanders, because we still, uh, here in Southwest Virginia, lack a very solid understanding of where this species actually occurs. And in the last few years, citizen scientists have been a huge help for us. And that includes people who are out hiking, who are rock climbing uh, on some of our public lands, and even people uh, around their private homes have encountered some of these salamanders, because we're increasingly finding uh, the green salamanders can live in some limited artificial structures, so things like uh, concrete block retaining walls that are shaded and moist, uh, things like wooden porches, the, the gaps between some of the slats or wood in those porches can form good crevices for those salamanders. So uh, we're basically asking the public to help us if they see any green salamanders to share those observations with us. And the flyer that you see here uh, basically outlines how to do that. If you do encounter a green salamander, we simply ask that you don't disturb it. So, you know, don't pick it up, don't remove it from its habitat, simply, you know, photograph it, get documentation of it and let it go on its way, and then record the date of that observation, the location of that observation, uh, your home address, if you're a private landowner, will be great. We will not share that information 
uh, with members of the public. And then forward that information along to myself or my collaborator, Kevin Hammond, whose contact is listed here at Virginia Tech. Uh, Kevin has been a phenomenal partner on this work over the last few years and has done some really great things uh, with habitat use with this species. Either of us will be happy to accept those observations, just forward uh, that information that I mentioned a moment ago, as well as the photograph onto us using this contact information here, just through email, I will work just fine. And that way you can actually help us better understand this very unique, uh, very charismatic organism that is really characteristic of our Southern Appalachian region. Thank you for joining me for my episode of 15 Minutes in the Forest. 